Good afternoon. Our focus this afternoon is on developing global church clergy leaders. We often talk about being a global church, and many times that means for us having United Methodist churches around the globe and leaders within those churches. But friends, we have experienced a paradigm shift. This nation is now in itself global. Our cities, our communities have many people from many nations. We live with neighbors from different cultures. We have skin colors who have skin colors different from our own. Our United States, United Methodist churches have members who came from other nations and are still coming. And our boards of ordained ministry are being asked to receive as candidates for ministry first generation immigrants. This presents us with challenges and our boards often have questions related to process and questions of immigration status. On the General Board of Higher Education and Ministry in the Division of Ordained Ministry, we presently have three first-generation Americans serving on our staff. Saul Espino, who was born in Cuba and unfortunately was unable to be with us at this event. Hero Park, who you will hear from in a moment, who was born in Korea, and myself from Great Britain. And you have heard today that one of our new members of staff, an AU graduate, is coming to us from Angola. Each of us has had very different experiences coming to this country. I am very much aware that the way I was received as a British citizen was very different from many of my colleagues and my brothers and sisters. My husband and I came to the United States 42 years ago now. He came as a seminary student. And he was appointed to a rural community as the student pastor. I thought I was going to find myself a job and help with the expenses of his education. But it wasn't until I got here that I learned if we were on student visas, I was not allowed to work. I tried being the local pastor's spouse in that community. Honestly, I did my best, but I was climbing the walls after a little while. And out of I have to confess now, sheer boredom. I asked him if I could go to seminary with him and just sit in on some of the classes and find out what he was learning about. I did that and then asked one of the professors, um, if I was to write the paper that you're asking, would you take a look at it? And that professor welcomed me and said yes and well, the short story of that is that after several months, the seminary came to me and said, we found a scholarship register as a student. That led to people seeing a potential in me that I am very grateful that they saw. That now, some 40 some years later, after serving in local churches, for over 20 years, and then now at the Board of Ordained Ministry, I'm sorry, the General Board of Ordained Ministry, for, um, I'm in my 12th year. I am grateful for those who welcomed me into this country to which I became a citizen. We looked around the connection and tried to see what was going on, and so, in addition to hearing from us today, you will hear from some conference, a conference 
that has experienced this. But before we do that, let me introduce my colleague, Hero Park, as you hear her story. Good afternoon. I'm the director of clergy lifelong learning in the division of Old Day Ministry. I work in the areas of continuing education, e-learnings, spiritual formation, support for clergy women and racial ethnic clergy. I came to the US in 1986. I started in the Oklahoma Annual Conference and was ordained as a deacon in 1990. However, I was appointed in the Baltimore Washington Annual Conference where there was more diversity. Bishop Dan E. Solomon and Bishop Joe Yeiko made this intentional, that is the key word, intentional arrangement for me. I transferred to the Baltimore Washington Annual Conference in 1992 and was ordained as an elder in 1993. I came a long way. Anita's case, at least she was able to speak language. <laughs> Starting from learning English, finishing all my theological education in the US, including my demean and PhD degrees, and serving local churches as cross-racial and cross-cultural ministry, and now serving the church as a general agency staff. Of course, I had to make sure that all my legal status is up to date. That was my responsibility. However, I have to say that those who saw my potential to be a good pastor and a leader of the church beyond my English accent and supported me with patience has been crucial for my successful ministry in the US. Because of their support, I was honored to serve as a delegate to the General Conference. So what I'm trying to say is, anything is possible. In the United Methodist Church, where our core value is being an inclusive church. However, each party, the candidate and leaders of the church should play their part with commitment and patience, then I believe that we will produce well-rounded, diverse global pastoral leaders. Thank you. The Northern Illinois Conference has experience in receiving many persons as first-generation immigrants, and so we are looking to them this afternoon to share their experience with us. We have with us three members of their board, Anjike Gonzalez, who is an ordained elder and chair of the Order of Elders, Margaret Ann Crane, who is a deacon and is a member of their board and a professor at Garrett Theological Seminary, and TJ Kim, an ordained elder and registrar for elders and candidates. They have come willing to share their experience of receiving immigrants, and we have given them a kind of list of points that we hope they will take a look at, which they have graciously done. And so we're going to look at some of the issues that you will face as they faced when dealing with first-generation immigrants. Thank you. Uh, Enrique Gonzalez serving at Rockford Centennial United Methodist Church, a multicultural church that is truly multicultural. 
So every time that I'm going to speak, I invite my congregation to, to, to tune your ears in an immigrant mode. Can we do that right now? Okay, sometimes you're, you're, I'm going to talk a little bit fast, be patient. Sometimes you're not going to understand, try to catch up, okay? That's part of our new culture. So today we're going to deal with the presentation about uh, immigrant uh, developing uh, global church with in, in, in clergy leaders and we're going to divide it in two pieces we're going to talk first about the immigrant candidates and after that we're going to talk about the interview process uh, many of the things that were arise during uh, our conversations and questions that were raised to uh, specifically the northern Illinois conference board of order ministry are trying to be answered through this presentation that means that many of the things that we are, you are about to see are practices of the Northern Illinois Conference and is part of uh, the process, not only of the Board of Ordained Ministry, but also of the Episcopal Office as well. Let's uh, begin with this presentation. Very good. Uh, when we have uh, immigrant candidates, uh, one of the things that we have to assume is that these candidates are not a possibility there are real people and there are an opportunity and because of this so many times it happens that when we hear or see or interview or talk about a candidate that is coming from the outside overseas we say oh okay let's give it a try let's let's see what happens and that's not the way that we are seeing it right now in the place where we exercise ministry in the Northern Illinois Conference. We require a commitment from the conference to engage the, in the process of recruiting, bringing, training, nurture, and deploy immigrant candidates. And it does require a commitment of the conference. Uh, we are already, as you, many of you can experience, uh, living in a global church within the United States. You can say, oh, well, but because you live in Chicago, uh, you can experience that. And brothers and sisters, I have been a consultant with the Hispanic Ministries in the, North, in the North National Plan for Hispanic Ministries, and I have witnessed complete towns, Nebraska, Kansas, which are completely uh, multicultural and multilingual. So this is not only on the metropolitan areas. Uh, when decision, when the decisions that uh, our conference has made about immigrant candidates. Uh, we have made a decision uh, that the immigrant process before the Department of Homeland Security is going to be run through the Episcopal Office, uh, in this case through the assistant of the bishop. We also decide, and this is when recommendations start to come up for each one of your conferences, we decide that the process for uh, application of visas and granting uh, work permits and permanent residence is going to be a centralized process. That means it's going to be run just by one entity, in this case, the Episcopal Office. Uh, no local churches, no districts. Again, repeating, no local churches, no districts in the conference label. And we're going to touch base about that in a minute. Uh, the conference becomes the sponsoring entity in the eyes of the Department of Homeland Security. And remember this relationship when we have, before the immigration authorities, we have the, the figure of who's, who's the sponsor, the immigrant. Well, the conference is the entity that becomes the sponsor of this particular immigrant. And in the eyes of the DHS, uh, the, 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 the immigrant belongs to that particular entity, which is the conference. Obviously, we don't do this because we are experts in filling papers, and I want to touch base and experience with you. Uh, I'm very glad that be one of those cases, and my beloved conference that received me here in the United States was the North Texas Conference, uh, and, and all these guys said, whoa, 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 over there. Yeah. Uh, this, uh, when we did this process, uh, Dr. Layton Farrell, the Dallas South District at that time, and I filled the papers in the best of our understanding. And we sent it to 
immigration and it worked out. But it was not our job description and we were not the persons indicated to do that. Don't do it again. Don't try it. There are immigration lawyers that are very capable and also uh, very knowledgeable about any other detail that is very particular in each one of the countries where these immigrants are coming. Uh, why not the district or local churches? Brothers and sisters, obviously, we are talking about open itinerancy. So to sponsor a candidate in one local church, it doesn't make any sense because the sponsored church becomes pretty much the legal entity that is gonna run the through process. Like we're closing the doors to that immigrant candidate. So it is important. I understand that there are, there are churches in your conferences that have more budget than the entire conference and they can hire the people, that's okay. But at the same time, you are, you are limiting the open itinerancy of that particular candidate. Number two, uh, and this is, you have to, to pay real attention on this particular new policy from DHS, uh, because the DHS found that it was a leaking of granting religious worker visas, then start to come to do site visits to the place uh, to the entity that is requesting the, uh, the, the, the legal status. In this case, we have received in uh, 77 Washington Street in the 18th floor, the six uh, officials of the DHS in Chicago to meet with the bishop, and they know the, the discipline of the United Methodist Church, and they know who we are. And it is important for you when we are going to engage this process, we also touch base and with, with the DHS office and let them know in the process that we, we are an entity, legal entity in the United States that is a sponsored candidate. Uh, and obviously money-wise, uh, because if we put all the candidates, immigrant candidates in the pipeline of an attorney, well, he's going to start to make discounts. And that's a good thing. We have discounts. Yes. Okay. Uh, as it happened to me, uh, people in the United States, especially the, the North Texas Conference, contact me and I say, we want you to come here. And in many cases, either Korea or, or India or um, in a particular place in Africa, you are willing to bring a candidate that is in, in, uh, in here or, her, or his or her home country. So this is the route number one. Okay, please, uh, you can look at the presentation right now, and we are more than willing to put this on the website where you're going to be able to download this presentation and have this process available for you. Uh, the background check of the candidate is run in their home country. And when you have this relationship, are you going to bring somebody from outside? The relationship is between churches. It's not be just between the candidate and the United Methodist Church. So the United Methodist Church ask and inquire the judicatory on the, on the home country. And I say, is this person real a Methodist? Is this a pastor? And the screening process and the background check is running the home country. Okay? When, we are, when, the, when the person is, is, is over there, overseas. Number two, the uh, conference sponsors and files an Air One visa, okay? Conference sponsors, not the candidate. The conference sponsors the Air One visa. Uh, and the application on behalf of the candidate, and this is a change of the process. If you have been running this process before, many of you know that Air One visas were granted for one year, not anymore. Now they are granted for 30 months, for two times. That comes to an up to 60 months, five potential years. After that, um, the, you, you can, in mean, meanwhile, that process of 30 or 60 months runs, you can appoint that person under 346.2 paragraph of the discipline, uh, a person that belongs to another denomination, and it could be appointed in this conference. Uh, it is not mentioned in the process, but each one of the relatives uh, that are on their age of 21 receive an R2 visa, which also are, and they are able to study and, and, and live in the United States. And after that, the conference applies for an adjustment of a status, which it means apply, is applying for legal permanent residency in the United States. 
So, and it's the conference. And I say, ooh, that's wonderful, beautiful that you're doing that. Yes, we are doing that, but this is a process that is, it costs, and it costs a lot of money. It costs between $3,000 and $5,000 do that particular process of, um, of the green visas. And the way that we are doing it right now is the conference pay, pays in advance uh, to support the candidate, to support the immigrant uh, candidate, and then uh, the candidate reimburse uh, to the conference in a, in, 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 in a payment plan or something. That's the way that we're doing it. And it's the commitment that the conference is, is presenting to these immigrant candidates. Uh, there is another process, and this process is when the person is a student in one of our seminaries. Um, that person uh, is already in the United States. He has an F-1 visa, and if it, it, it does have an F-1 visa, the background check is not run in the home country, it's run here through, uh, with the social security number that that particular student has. Um, the student may receive an appointment under the provision on an OPT, which is in the framework of the F-1 visa. That particular person can do practical training. That's what PT means. Uh, uh, the, the in, in, and, and he doesn't have to apply for more status. They can do it under that provision. After graduation, the person has to apply for an R1 visa and run the process that I just explained a few minutes ago in the slide, in the previous slide. Well, uh, enough, enough, en enough with this uh, particular processes. It's gonna, it's gonna, we're gonna have a time to make questions and answers. And there are more things that I want, we want to offer in, par in this particular uh, possibility of bringing immigrant candidates and run these application processes. Also in the website, we're gonna put in PDF format uh, all the information that is coming from the DHS regarding all the documentation that you have to have for these particular candidates. Well, let's move to uh, a second thought and I'm gonna pass this presentation to my two colleagues here. Uh, radical hospitality for the interview process. Uh, and this part of the radical hospitality that we practice in the Northern Illinois Conference is based on three aspects. The diversity on the Board of Ordnance Ministry, cultural sensitivity in the candidacy process, and a third and very important point, not assumptions or uh, prejudice uh, in our candidates. And with this, Mary Ann, please uh, continue with this conversation. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Margaret Ann Crane, and um, I was born in the U.S., and I'm white. <laughs> That's important, and it's very important for all of us who have those um, characteristics to be aware of our position in the midst of this global church. The world has already come to Chicago, and I think that we in the, in the United Methodist Church in Chicago, in the Northern Illinois Conference, have made a commitment to try to make our church look like the world. And so you will find um, that commitment to diversity in our leadership in the conference, um, in the people we elect to general conference and jurisdictional conference, and on our Board of Ordained Ministry. That means that people like me have a lot to learn. For instance, what Enrique just told us about is like, I didn't know anything about all that. How many of you didn't know anything about all that? I'm sure there are many, many of us in this room. So I've learned, I guess, in, by being taught so well by my colleagues in the Northern Illinois Conference that I need to learn to listen with my heart as well as my head, uh, particularly when I meet someone whose first language is not English. I need to learn to hear the giftedness and the call in the midst of a person who is struggling to find the English words my students have many nuanced, sophisticated ideas that they cannot always express fully in English. So we need to go back and forth until both of us are, are thinking about the same things. But at the same time, and I, I hear your wheels turning, 
Um, we have to balance the needs of the United Methodist Church in Northern Illinois, and we have a lot of Anglo congregations who may um, not have much experience with persons from other cultures. I want to tell you a couple little stories just briefly that, that to me are emblematic of the things I've needed to learn over the years. Uh, at the moment I have a small group of people that I'm mentoring in the candidacy process, candidacy level, and one of them is a new immigrant to the United States. She's from Korea. And another one is a woman who has been in the U.S. for quite a while, but is also Korean. She grew up in Korea, but she's been in the U.S. maybe for 20 years. And we were chatting about this and that and about um, where we bump up against sexism as women in the church. Yes, that still exists too. And um, the one who had been here for 20 years suddenly, in the middle of the conversation, turns to the other one and she says, you know, they make their beds differently than we do. And that to me was just, you know, a sign of what are the things that are different about us that I don't even know? And how do I make a space to find out? And, and a space so that the person who um, didn't know that her bed was made differently than mine, um, and I can talk about that in a space where neither one of us is judging the other, since it's not really probably a matter for judgment, simply what we're used to. <laughs> At the same time, I think it's very important for me to tell the truth in that mentoring setting, to say, you know, it's very likely you're going to be appointed to a congregation of people who don't look like you and don't speak Korean. So you're going to need to be prepared for that. I can think of two situations lately, um, one of them uh, for one of the the mentees in this group I've been telling you about, where um, when she was interviewed by the district committee, they were very concerned that her English was still, she was still really struggling a lot with English, and they want her to become more fluent. So they made suggestions as to things she could do to help her become more fluent. The other thing we were really concerned about at the district committee, I was there as a mentor, so I was just listening, yeah, I know, I know, uh, I was just listening, but um, they said she needs some experience in an Anglo congregation because so often it's a Korean congregation that will give a job to these students and support them as they're uh, making their way through seminary. And one of the people on the DCOM said, I would be pleased to have her do her field education this year in my church and I will make sure she gets experiences that she needs to have with the Anglo congregation. People are stepping up to do things like that, and that is hospi hospitable. That's radical hospitality. Oh, yeah, I have to look over here. <laughs> um, Enrique told me this, and then I forgot. What, what's here on our laptop is not what's on your screen. So um, on our uh, Board of Ordained Ministry, we do have a lot of ethnic diversity and cultural diversity and racial diversity and uh, gender diversity. And we in, try to be really careful as we try to move beyond the language barrier then to listen with our hearts as well as our heads. And I might say with our spirits. Um, the written material is sometimes um, not in smooth English. And we've been overlooking that, and I think now our district committees are going to be a little more insistent that people find a good English editor if they need it, that's okay. And that, um, but at the same time, we need to be sensitive to people for whom English is a second language. We try not to make assumptions. Oh, yeah, we focus on their talents and gifts, absolutely. So um, I'm going to turn it over now to another colleague, T.J. Kim, who's going to talk about how we organize our interview process when they come to the board. Hello, uh, my name is T.J. Kim from Northern Illinois Conference. Um, at our uh, board, the annual conference board, we, as it has been explained to you, uh, try to provide radical hospitality. 
And I think sometimes we get frustrated because that takes a lot of work. And sometimes we wonder, I mean, is it really worthwhile to do all that? For example, we uh, try to make sure that if the ethnic minority person comes on for, uh, to the board for interview, we make sure that there's at least one person in the, in the interview team with the same ethnic background. So if it's a Korean candidate, then we'll make sure that uh, we have a one, at least one Korean person in that interview team. And it takes a lot of juggling, uh, um, and uh, I guess you know, coming up with a team uh, for those uh, candidates, I mean, it takes a lot of work. But um, I've, I've talked to uh, some of the candidates who came before our board, and they say it sometimes, I mean, uh, it really helps them. I was just talking to another person this afternoon, and he said sometimes it's intimidating to have another Korean in there because sometimes it's a Korean, another Korean person who asks a you know, tougher question. When other person, other uh, uh, team members, you know, try to be nice to this ethnic minority person. You know, the same ethnic minority person doesn't have to feel that, doesn't have, does not have that guilty feeling, so I end up asking tougher questions. But, but the presence of that person psychologically uh, is really helpful. And I think a lot of times also there's a, sometimes the, the language proficiency comes into, uh, into play. Uh, I've heard that the, for Korean uh, uh, candidates to to finish psychological testing, they takes, it takes about five hours when uh, other candidates takes only two and a half hours because you know, they have to look up the dictionary. A lot of times they don't get the, the, the different nuances of the word, so they end up answering the question in a kind of diff, uh, wrong way. So the result comes up and a lot of times they wonder, is this me or someone else? Uh, but, uh, but during the interview process when there's another Korean person is present, sometimes the question, the, if the candidate does not understand the different nuances of the, the word that was being used, it, it can be translated, uh, I guess, more actively. So, you know, in that regard, it's been helpful. Um, and there were, there were times when uh, the person struggled with the language. I think, I remember one time, it was a long time ago, uh, this, this candidate were supposed to provide a, a video uh, of uh, his sermon, and uh, his English was so poor that we could not understand that. And then the person was just fixed on the, on the script, script. So we asked him to just preach in his own language, which is Korean, and then submit the, that video as well, because we wanted to see him, uh, see how passionate he can be with the, the message that he was, was delivering. I don't think we do that anymore, but I think we try to sometimes go beyond what is required to provide that kind of hospitality, to really discern, uh, you know, not his or her language proficiency, but God's calling to that person. Um, as said earlier, if the written material isn't good, uh, we don't really, uh, we don't, you know, uh, uh, we don't, uh, the, take that uh, against the person for all the grammatical errors that the person made. We try to really see uh, his, theolo his or her theological views that, that, that he or she tried to, to express. Um, and one thing that we're getting out of all this is the, um, I guess culture diversity also is, has, has, has a uh, relationship to the theological diversity, because we're in different culture, we see God in a different way. I think that, that's what we begin, that's what we end up gaining, uh, the theological diversity, seeing God in a different way. And so a lot of times during this interview process, even though we have to strain our ears to, to really, to be able to listen to what the candidates are saying, but we ended up uh, with a sense of tremendous blessing of being able to see God in a totally different way, a new way, the way that we have not been able to before. And I think that's, and I think that's why our conference is committed to, to providing this radical hospitality because, because of their presence and because the insights, the experience they bring in, uh, in spite of this, these language barriers and cultural barriers, and end up enriching us and I think that's really, you know, that's what really important.
for, for, for our church. Um, I was born in Korea, and I came to the States when I was 15 years old. And uh, I grew up in Korean church all my life. And uh, somehow I ended up in a, uh, in a uh, Caucasian church uh, in, a, uh, in a really, uh, what they call a bun, you know, bundok area. Where and it was a, a church where, in that whole county where the church was, ours was the only Asian family. Not in the city, but whole county. Um, when, I, when I found out I was appointed to there, I dreaded going there. But it ended up being the, the most wonderful experience in my whole life. Really seeing God in, in, in a very different way. When I was ordained, and when I went to seminary, and also for my ordination uh, autobiographical statement, I said I was called to minister to Korean church, especially second generation Korean Americans. I never dreamed of going to a Caucasian church and serving white people. But that experience really in expanded, expanded my understanding of God and what my life you know, should be about. And I think the same thing happened to our congregation. One of the one unforgettable experiences that I had was I used to visit the, uh, the cemetery in uh, the town that I was serving at, and I found this, this tombstone that, that, that told me that the person died during the Korean War. And when I found out that there's this person who, who lived in a place where I never knew existed, and, whether I, and in a place where I never expected I would be there, but there was this person who was intimately connected to me, me being, you know, Korean, by, in, in the way of, you know, just ultimate sacrifice, through the ultimate sacrifice he could offer. And I realized, you know, that's how God works. God is a lot bigger than, than, than who, you know, who sometimes, you know, that, that we think of who God is. And I think we are always, I think God is challenging us to really in, expand ourselves, enlarge ourselves. I think that's what all these immigrants, uh, college members can really bring to the United Methodist Church. So it will, be, it will, it will, be, it will not only be good for those people, I guess uh, the, uh, Reverend Park shared his, her own success story, it will be important for them to be able to reclaim who they are in this land of opportunity. But also, I think it will be important for us all, for our church, in our endeavor to become the church that God wants us to be. Thank you. I'd like to give you time for some table discussion and there are three questions that we had posed to the Northern Illinois Conference that they have answered from their perspective that we'd like to hear from about your experience in your annual conference. So these three questions are I believe going to be put up now. Thank you. Um, one is around how you conduct your interviews for candidates. Um, who are not proficient in English. And then checking um, on the immigration status. Do you have somebody who does that, who has expertise in that, and who does that on behalf of the conference? And then to look at um, any written policies that you might have developed in your annual conferences around the use of English and how you help persons become proficient in going into an Anglo congregation where the, the expectation is that they have good English speaking skills or American speaking, whatever that might be. <laughs> yeah, incidentally, you may think there aren't many cultural differences, but there are enormous ones for a British person coming to this country. Anyway, these are the questions we'd like you to discuss around your tables, and then if there are questions that you would like dealt with out of your conversation, there are pads on the table that you can take notes. 
And then we will have a time, we have two microphones here, we will have a time when you can ask back questions um, that you might have. So is that clear? Look at the three questions we've given you or other issues that it brought up through this presentation. Make some notes on there and if you've got, then can form a question from your table, we will have an opportunity for you to ask those questions. So we will give you now um, 10 minutes to do this discussing at your table and then we'll come back for a question time. Thank you. Okay, if you'd like to finish the sentence that you are speaking right now, we will then gather back as a group. Long sentence. Okay, we have given you an opportunity to, to discuss this at your table and to maybe raise some other issues that were not raised and some questions that you might have. So we have two microphones on the floor here, one over this side, one over there. And if you have a question, if you would make your way to that microphone, uh, we would be happy to hear that question. And, and if you have a specific person to whom you want to address the question, let us know. If not, we will see who uh, would like to respond to it. Okay, over here, thank you. The speaker mentioned that the Koreans had a hard time uh, answering the assessment questions because, it, because of the translation. So our question is, is it not possible for us to get some of these assessment tools in languages other than English, specifically in Spanish and Korean? And where, do we, where would we get those? I'm going to ask Meg Glacier, who is our candidacy, um, and what's the whole candidacy title? Candidacy Mentoring and Conference Relations. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Can, we all have long titles. They're in that book. Candidacy Mentoring and um, Annual Conference Relations. But We're, this comes under her purview, so thank yeah, you. Yeah, the, the candidacy office does mo um, moderate psychological assessment tests and provide that service for annual conferences. We currently have the three standard assessments that we use are the MMPI, the uh, 16PF, and an incomplete sentences blank. Those three standard assessments are available in Spanish and in English right now. Um, and we've been using them um, with Spanish language with a lot of success. We are researching the Korean language and working to make that available. We actually were in contact with our uh, vendor service last week to talk about providing Korean, and I, I need to run this with, through with the Psychological Assessment Committee that I work with on this. So we're, we are working on that, but English and Spanish are currently available. If you need a Spanish assessment, contact the candidacy office, and we'll be happy to help you. I'll, I'll repeat, are they just translations or are they standardized? And um, my understanding is that they have been tested and standardized to use with the different languages. So it's not simply a translation, but written in a way that a native Spanish or other language speaker could use them. Part of the issue, though, is going to be having a psychologist or ministerial assessment specialist who can interpret and provide a good report for that cultural context. Go ahead. There's another person right there. Okay. Thank you. New York Annual Conference. Um, one of the struggles that we have, and we've heard it said a couple times, about the importance of having uh, pastors being able to serve any church anywhere. Um, but in New York, that is not our world. We're, we're really clear that there are congregations where a pastor needs a particular set of skills and maybe languages among those in order to be effective. And so we're, we struggle with the notion of what are the core competencies that we think that every pastor needs to have and those that are going to be specifically suited to uh, churches where it's Korean or Chinese or Spanish or uh, another variety of cultural dynamics that require, I mean, we would train and do train missionaries for the particularities of their context. 
and so it is that variety of dynamic that affects both our language and our inclusion of of a wide variety of candidates but recognizing that we need candidates with very specific skills and abilities that frankly i don't have in order to serve god's people in those locations and so that balance is is a challenge for us Do you want to make comment on that from Northern Illinois? I heard you talking to those issues. Yes. Uh, we have we have a sheet of those core competencies that we use as we um, interview people, and it's the same for everybody. But you're absolutely right that um, you know I can't serve a Korean congregation. I don't speak Korean, and. Um, some of these people I've been telling you the stories about are the ones we need for those places. I think that the challenge for us as a church is going to be, you know, does it come out even? And it's not always going to come out even. Uh, I'm speaking strictly for myself, not for anybody else. I, I long for the day when our conference boundaries get much more permeable and we can move our leadership around where they're needed and uh, meet those needs. But that's just my personal con opinion. Yes. Yes. Uh, Eddie Rivera from Northwest Texas. Um, our conference is beginning to train or uh, uh, considering to train uh, Hispanic Latino leaders for ministry. And there are all the conferences that also are interested in this uh, opportunity to uh, provide uh, equipping and training. Earlier today, we were asked the question if, um, where would you utilize uh, the seven million dollars for uh, young clergy? Um, and if the conferences can uh, be part of re uh, receiving uh, some of that money so that we can equip young clergy uh, that will benefit actually our conferences and our ministries uh, in the ethnic minority areas, and so if is that a possibility? Is, if it is, uh, how do we go about uh, to uh, uh, present a, a request, or um, how would you guide us in this question? Is there one of my colleagues who'd like to respond to that? Thank you. Our General Secretary, Kim Kate, will respond. Thank you for, for uh, your input. Uh, those those uh, responses that we're getting, uh, send that to us, and we will, we will follow up in, in our uh, decision making. So thanks for the input. Just be sure that you send it to us so we can uh, stir it in the mix. Thanks. Okay, over here, another question. Conference, and I believe probably Meg, this is Meg's uh, uh, bailiwick. Um, I didn't happen to bring all of the uh, application forms and all that with me. Uh, doubt if anybody else did. Maybe Meg's got some on her laptop. And my memory is cloudy enough now because most of that is ancient history for me, but is there a point in the application process where an individual indicates that they are a U.S. citizen or where, if there is not, what point in the process would it be appropriate for boards to inquire about that or about their immigration status so that we know that we're on the proper track? Uh, <laughs> uh. There is, at this point, there is no, in, in the, in the if, if, and correct me if I'm wrong, but my interpretation of the discipline is that there is no place in the, com, in, the, in, the, in, the in the discipline that states that a person has to be a, 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 a legal, per, a legal resident of the United States or U.S. citizens to serve in the United States. It doesn't say that, Obvious, uh, well, but we are, subject to all these 
uh, rules of immigration that tell us that you have to. So at, at this point in the, in, in, in the Northern Illinois Conference, who, who does that is the Episcopal Office. They are the one that, 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 that inquire about it. Is, is, is that it be because of the granting process that, I, that we just went through? Uh, if that answers your question. It is something that could be uh, uh, in the future for being in the discipline or one of the processes is something that all of us, we have to, to come, come out. And, uh, Oh, because of the same process. Good question. Uh, many, many of us. Well, th this is not. This is not a brothers and sisters. This is not an e-verify stuff. No, you know that e-verify. E how many of you are familiar with e-verify? Man, I can't believe it. So, brothers and sisters, you live in the United States. You need to know this. So, e-verify is the running process that 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 DHS is implementing to check that every other person is legal in the United States to work. So, uh, and, and, and it's, in, it's everywhere. Anyway, so E-Verify, we don't use, you don't use E-Verify e because when the person comes to apply in the immigrant process, through the immigrant process, uh, in the D, with, before the DHS, is the DHS that the one that in, in, immediately answers that. It's the process itself, the one that, that, that inquires what is the status of the candidate. And, and if not, if the person says, I do have a social security number, is the background check the one that it says if the person is legal or not. It's the background check through the company where your conference runs the background check. And I, I just want to add to that, that um, there is a great deal of difference between having a legal status and citizenship. Um, my husband and I were here for many years as permanent residents with legal status, the question of whether one chooses to become or applies to become a United States citizen is a whole nother question. When you are up there and taking a vow to, to commit to another country and leave behind any um, strong association with another. That citizenship question is quite different. And in today's present atmosphere, the process is very long and very drawn out and can get extremely costly for persons. So I do think we need to be very much aware of what the different legal statuses are and what we're asking. Um, if we go to the citizenship question. Yes. Gene Cochran, South Georgia. Uh, we have, the state of Georgia has a law. I know it's ha effect happened to me the last couple of times I moved that when you're assigned to a new church, you come to a new church, you have to fill out a form uh, informing the state of your status, whether you're an immigrant or a citizen or whatever. But I don't know whether all the states do that, but Georgia's doing that now, that we have to report that. Right, right. Okay, do we have other questions of anyone here or from for General Board of Higher Education and Ministry? Then we thank you for your time to discuss these issues. And uh, if you have further questions and if there are ways we can uh, uh, help you address those questions, we'll be very glad to do that. I'm going to um, call on my colleagues now um, to do some introductions. Yeah. Thank you.
I'd like to invite the General Board of Higher Education and Ministry staff to come to the front at this time, please. In your package, you have a, a directory of the GBHEM staff. We, want, we thought it was important that you be able to put faces with names. And so I'm not going to go into the, the uh, job descriptions of all these persons. I'm Kim Cape. I'm the General Secretary. Meg Lassier, you've met. Anita Wood, Hero Park, you just saw a moment ago. Tom Carter, Rena Yoakum, right here, and Trip Lowry, you met earlier. There's Hero, Lori Hewlett. She's the one that keeps the wheels on the truck here. Was there someone else that we missed? Okay, okay, great. Uh, Jean and Paula, so uh, Jean Knox, Paula Gardner, uh, the, these names are all in your, in your booklet so you can put faces with names, you'll know who you're talking to when you contact us. Thank you all. mentioned Saul Espino and Bruce Fenner were not able to be here with us for this event. However, we did want to lift up Anita. You need to come back. Anita, Anita, come on back. We have two retirements coming up within the Division of Ordained Ministry. Saul Espino will be retiring, I believe it's March 1st, and Anita Wood will also be retiring March 1st. And we just wanted to say thank you and congratulations. <laughs> to be congratulated when you retire because it's kind of like, okay, congratulations on getting old. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm glad to be this age and still be um, alive and well. <laughs> and and um, I hope that those two position openings are kind of uh, making you think about possible replacements and you will encourage um, a, de a deacon and other persons to apply for those positions. So thank you. Thanks. We have one announcement. Um, there has been a request for a time for those who are on the younger side of the age group here to be able to gather together for dinner tonight. So we're going to, which is over here right now, table number five. Tonight, when you come in at the front of the room, we will have a table reserved for younger adults who would like to gather for some conversation. So, uh, <laughs> I, I'm not going to define what younger adult is. <laughs> and you at table number five will have to decide if you fit that. So. But thank you for your time today. Uh, we'll be on break now until the first workshop begins at 3.15. <laughs>